Chapter Twenty Six of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six. Visits of Ceremony. Mr. Langton, on being informed that Mark Ashburn proposed to become his son-in-law, took a painfully prosaic view of the matter. "'I can quite understand the fascination of a literary career to a young man,' he had observed to Mark, in the course of a trying interview. "'Indeed, when I was younger, I was frequently suspected myself of contributing to punch, but I always saw where that would lead me, and, as a matter of fact, I never did indulge my inclinations in that direction,' he added, with the complacency of a St. Anthony. "'And the fact is, I wish my son-in-law to have a more assured position.' you see at present you have only written one book oh i am quite aware that illusion was well received remarkably so indeed but then it remains to be proved whether you can follow up your success and and in short while that is uncertain i can't consent to any engagement you really must not ask me to do so and in this determination he was firm for some time even though secretly impressed on hearing of the sum for which Mark had already disposed of his forthcoming novel, and which represented, indeed, a very fair year's income. It was Uncle Solomon, after all, that proved the heavy piece of ordnance which turned the position at the crisis. He was flattered when his nephew took him into his confidence, and pleased that he should have looked so high, which motives combined to induce him to offer his influence. It was a somewhat desperate remedy, and Mark had his doubts of the impression likely to be produced by such a relative, but it worked unexpectedly well. Mr. Lightowler was too cautious to commit himself to any definite promise, but he made it abundantly clear that he was a warm man, and that Mark was his favourite nephew, for whom he was doing something as it was, and might do more if he continued to behave himself. After the interview in which this was ascertained, Mr. Langton began to think that his daughter might do worse than marry this young Ashburn, after all. Mrs. Langton had liked Mark from the first in her languid way, and the fact that he had expectations decided her to support his cause. He was not a brilliant parti, of course, but at least he was more eligible than the young men who had been exciting her maternal alarm of late, and under her grandfather's will, mabel would be entitled on her marriage or coming of age to a sum which would keep her in comfort whatever happened all these considerations had their effect and mr langton seeing how deeply his daughter's heart was concerned withdrew his opposition and even allowed himself to be persuaded that there was no reason for a long engagement and that the marriage might be fixed to take place early in the following spring he only made two stipulations one that mark should insure his life in the usual manner and the other that he should abandon his nom de plume at once and in the next edition of illusion and in all future writings use the name which was his by birth i don't like aliases he said if you win a reputation it seems to me your wife and family should have the benefit of it and mark agreed to both conditions with equal cheerfulness Mr. Humpage, as may be imagined, was not best pleased to hear of the engagement. He wrote a letter of solemn warning to Mabel and her father, and this being disregarded, he nursed his resentment in offended silence. If Harold Caffin was polite enough when in his uncle's company to affect to share his indignation to the full, elsewhere he accepted Mark's good fortune with cheerful indifference. He could meet Mabel with perfect equanimity, and listened to her mother's somewhat discursive eulogies of her future son-in-law with patience, if not entire assent. Since his autumn visit to the Featherstones, there had been changes in his position which may have been enough to account for his philosophy. He had gained the merchant's good opinion to such an extent that the latter, in defiance of his wife's cautions, had taken the unusual step of proposing that the young actor should give up the stage and occupy a recently vacated desk in Mr. Featherstone's own palatial city offices. Even if his stage ambition had not cooled long since, Caffin was not a man to neglect such a chance as this. He accepted gratefully, and already the merchant saw his selection, unlikely as it had seemed at first, 
beginning to be justified by his protégé's clear head and command of languages while gilda's satisfaction at the change was at least equal to her father's and so whether harold was softened by his own prosperity and whether other hopes or distractions came between him and his former passion for revenge he remained impassive throughout all the preparations for a marriage which he could have prevented had he chosen at triburg the thought that mark who had as he considered been the chief means of ruining his hopes of mabel was to be his successful rival had for an instant revived the old spirit but now he could face the fact with positive contentment and his feeling towards mark was rather one of contemptuous amusement than of any actual hostility mark's introduction of mabel to his family had not been altogether a success he regretted that he had carelessly forgotten to prepare them for his visit as soon as he pulled the bell-handle by the gate and caught a glimpse of scared faces at one or two of the windows followed by sounds from within of wild scurry and confusion like a lot of confounded rabbits he thought to himself in disgust then they had been kept waiting in a chilly little drawing-room containing an assortment of atrocities in glass china worsted and wax until mark moved restlessly about in his nervous irritation and mabel felt her heart sink in spite of her love she had not expected to find mark's people in luxurious surroundings but she was unprepared for anything quite so hideous as that room when mrs ashburn who had felt that this was an occasion for some attention to toilette made her appearance it was hardly a reassuring one she was not exactly vulgar perhaps but she was hard mabel thought narrow and ungenial but the fact was that the consciousness of having been taken unawares robbed her welcome of any cordiality which it might otherwise have possessed she inferred from her first glance at mabel's pretty walking costume a fondness for dress and extravagance which branded her at once as a worldling between whom and herself there could be nothing in common in which last opinion she was most probably right as all mabel's efforts to sustain a conversation could not save it from frequent lapses martha from shyness as much as stiffness sat by in almost complete silence and though trixie the only other member of the family who appeared was evidently won at once by mabel's appearance and did all she could to cover the other's shortcomings she was not sufficiently at her ease to break the chill and mark angry and ashamed as he was felt paralyzed himself under its influence on the way back he was unusually silent from a fear of the impression such an ordeal as she had gone through must have left upon mabel and the fact that she did not refer to the interview herself did not reassure him he need not have been afraid however she was not in the least deterred by what she had seen the sight of the home in which he had been brought up had filled her with a loving pity suggesting as it did the petty constraints and miseries the unloveliness of all surroundings and the total want of appreciation which he must have endured there and yet all this had not soured him in spite of it he had produced a great book strong yet refined and tender and free from any taint of narrowness or cynicism as she thought of this and glanced at mark's handsome face so bright and animated in general but clouded now with the melancholy which his fine eyes could express at times she longed to say something to relieve it and yet shrank from being the first to speak in her fear of jarring him mark spoke at last well mabel he said looking down at her with a rather doubtful smile i told you that my mother was a uh, a little peculiar yes said mabel frankly we didn't quite get on together did we mark we shall some day perhaps and even if not i shall have you and she laid her hand on his sleeve with a look of perfect understanding and contentment which little as he deserved it chased away all his fears End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty seven clear sky and a thunderbolt 
"'Has anyone,' asks George Eliot in Middlemarch, "'ever pinched into its pillulous smallness "'the cobweb of pre-matrimonial acquaintance? "'And, to press the metaphor, "'the cobweb, as far as Mark and Mabel were concerned, "'brilliantly as it shone in all its silken iridescence, "'would have rolled up into a particularly small pill. "'Mark was anxious that his engagement "'should be as short as possible, "'chiefly from an uneasy fear "'that his great happiness might elude him after all.' the idea of losing mabel became day by day as he knew her better a more intolerable torture and he could not rest until all danger of that was at an end mabel had no fears of a future in which mark would be by her side and if she was not blind to some little weaknesses in his character they did not affect her love and admiration in the least she was well content that her hero should not be unpleasantly perfect and the weeks slipped by until easter which fell early that year had come and gone the arrangements for the wedding were all completed and mark began to breathe more freely as he saw his suspense drawing to a happy end it was a bleak day towards the end of march and mark was walking across the park and gardens from his rooms in south audley street to malakoff terrace charged with a little note from mabel to trixie to which he was to bring back an answer for although mabel had not made much progress in the affections of the rest of the ashburn household a warm friendship had sprung up already between herself and mark's youngest sister the only one of them who seemed to appreciate and love him as he deserved he felt buoyant and happy as he walked briskly on with the blustering north-easter at his back seeming to clear his horizon of the last clouds which had darkened it a very few days more and mabel would be his own beyond the power of man to sunder and soon too he would be able to salve the wound which still rankled in his conscience he would have a book of his own sweet bells jangled was to appear almost immediately and he had come to have high hopes of it it looked most imposing in proof it was so much longer than illusion he had worked up a series of such overwhelming effects in it its pages contained matter to please every variety of taste flippancy and learning sensation and sentiment careful dissection of character and audacious definition and epigram failure seemed to him almost impossible and when he could feel able to lay claim legitimately to the title of genius surely then the memory of his fraud would cease to reproach him the means would be justified by the result he amused himself by composing various critiques of the book all of course highly eulogistic and thus pleasantly occupied the way until he gained the cheerful kensington high street the first half of which seems to belong to some bright little market town many miles further from charing cross in the road by the curbstone he passed a street singer a poor old creature in a sunbonnet with sharp features that had been handsome once and brilliant dark eyes who was standing there unregarded singing some long forgotten song with the remnants of a voice mark's happiness impelled him to put some silver into her hand and he felt a half superstitious satisfaction as he heard the blessing she called down on him as if she might have influence no one was at home at malakoff terrace but trixie whom he found busily engaged in copying an immense plaster nose jack says i must practise harder at features before i try the antique she explained and so he gave me this nose it's his first present and considered a very fine cast jack says never saw a finer nose anywhere said mark looks as if it had been forced eh trixie mark don't cried trixie shocked at his irreverence it's david's michelangelo's david he gave her mabel's note i can't write back because my hands are all charcoaly she explained but you can say my love and i will if i possibly can and oh yes tell her i had a letter from him this morning meaning jack said mark all right and oh i say trixie why won't the governor and mater come to my wedding it's all ma said trixie 
she says she should only feel herself out of place at a fashionable wedding and she's better away it's going to be a very quiet affair though thank heaven observed mark yes but don't you see what she really wants is to be able to feel injured by being out of it all if she can she'll persuade herself in time that she never was invited at all you know what dear ma is well said mark with considerable resignation she must do as she pleases of course have you got anything else to tell me trixie because i shall have to be going soon you mustn't go till i've given you something that came for you oh a long time ago when ma was ill you see it was like this ma had her breakfast in bed and there was a tray put down on the slab where it was and it was sticky underneath or something and so it stuck to the bottom and the tray wasn't wanted again and anne of course didn't choose to wash it so she only found it yesterday and brought it to me trixie said mark i can't follow all those its i gather that i'm entitled to something sticky but i haven't a notion what hadn't you better get it whatever it happens to be why it's a letter of course goose said trixie i told you that the very first thing wait here and i'll bring it to you so mark waited patiently in the homely little back parlour where he had prepared his work as a schoolboy in the old days where he had smoked his first cigar in his first cambridge vacation he smiled as he thought how purely intellectual his enjoyment of that cigar had been and how for the first time he had appreciated the meaning of the bitter end he was smiling still when trixie returned whom do you know in india mark she said curiously perhaps it's some admirer who's read the book i hope it's nothing really important if it is it wasn't our fault that mark you're not ill are you no said mark placing himself with his back to the light and stuffing the letter after one hasty glance at the direction unopened into his pocket of course not why should i be is there anything in the letter to worry you persisted trixie it can't be a bill can it never mind what it is said mark have you got the keys uh, i should like a glass of wine ma left the keys in the cupboard said trixie how lucky port or sherry mark brandy if there is any he said with an effort brandy oh mark have you taken to drinking spirits and so early in the morning she asked with an anxious misgiving that perhaps that was de rigueur with all literary men no no don't be absurd i want some just now and quick do you hear i caught a chill walking across he explained you had better try to eat something with it then she advised have some cake do you want to make me ill in earnest he retorted peevishly thrusting away the brown cake with a stale flavour of cupboard about it with which trixie tried to tempt him there it's all right there's nothing the matter i tell you and he poured out the brandy and drank it there was a kind of comfort or rather distraction in the mere physical sensation to his palate he thought he understood why some men took to drinking ha <sighs> and he made a melancholy attempt at the sigh of satisfaction which some people think expected of them after spirits now i'm a man again trixie that has driven off the chill i'll be off now are you sure you're quite well again she said anxiously very well then i shan't see you again till you're in church next tuesday and oh mark i do so hope you'll be very very happy he was on the doorstep by this time and made no reply while he kept his face turned from her good-bye then she said you won't forget my message to mabel will you let me see what was it he said oh i remember your love and you will if you can eh yes and say i've had a letter from him this morning she added he gave a strange laugh and then as he turned she saw how ghastly and drawn his face looked have you though he said wildly so have i trixie so have i and before she could ask any further questions he was gone he walked blindly up the little street and into the main road again unable at first to think with any clearness he had not read the letter 
the stamp and handwriting on the envelope were enough for him the bolt had fallen from a clear sky the thing he had only thought of as a nightmare had really happened the sea had given up its dead he went on there was the same old woman in the sunbonnet still crooning the same song he laughed bitterly to think of the difference in his own life since he had last seen her only a short half hour ago he passed the parish church from which a wedding party was just driving while the bells clashed merrily under the graceful spire no wedding bells would ever clash for him now but he must read that letter and know the worst holroyd was alive that he knew but had he found him out did that envelope contain bitter denunciations of his treachery perhaps he had already exposed him he could not rest until he knew how this might be and yet he dared not read his letter in the street he thought he would find out a quiet spot in kensington gardens and read it there alone quite alone he hurried on with a dull irritation that the high street should be so long and so crowded and that everybody should make such a point of getting in the way the shock had affected his body as well as his mind he was cold to the bones and felt a dull numbing pressure on the top of his head and yet he welcomed these symptoms too with an odd satisfaction they seemed to entitle him to some sympathy he reached the gardens at last but when he had turned in at the little postern door near the king's arms he could not prevail upon himself to open the letter he tore it half open and put it back irresolutely he must find a seat and sit down he struck up the hill with the wind in his teeth now until he came to the round pond where there was quite a miniature sea breaking on the southwestern rim of the basin a small boy was watching a solitary ship labouring far out in the centre and mark stood and watched it too mechanically till he turned away at last with a nervous start of impatience once he had sailed ships on those waters what would he not give if those days could come back to him again or if even he could go back these past few months to the time when his conscience was clear and he feared no man but the past was irrevocable he had been guilty of this reckless foolish fraud and now the consequences were upon him he walked restlessly on under the bare tossing branches looking through the black trunks and across the paths glimmering white in the blue-grey distance for a seat where he might be safe from interruption until at last he discovered a clumsy wooden bench scored and slashed with the sand ingrained initials of a quarter of a century's idleness a seat of the old uncomfortable pattern gradually dying out from the walks he could wait no longer and was hurrying forward to secure it when he was hailed by someone approaching by one of the bayswater paths and found that he had been recognized by harold caffin end of chapter twenty seven Chapter Twenty Eight of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight. Mark knows the worst. To avoid Caffin was out of the question, and so Mark waited for him with as much self-control as he could muster, as he strolled leisurely up. Caffin's quick eye saw at once that something unusual had happened, and he resolved to find out what that was before they parted thought it must be you he began so you've come out here to meditate on your coming happiness have you come along and pour out some of your raptures it will do you good and you don't know what a listener i can be not now said mark uneasily ah uh, i think i would rather be alone nonsense said caffin briskly you don't really mean that i know why i'm going away tomorrow to the lakes i must have a little talk with you before i go what are you going there for said mark without much show of interest my health my boy old featherstone has let me out for a fortnight's run and i'm going to see what mountain air can do for me and where are you going now asked mark now well i was going across to see if the featherstones would give me some lunch but i'm in no hurry i'll go wherever you want to go thanks said mark 
but but i won't take you out of your way it's not taking me out of my way a bit i assure you my boy and we haven't had a talk together for ages so come along i can't said mark more uncomfortably still i have some some business which i must see to alone odd sort of place this for business no no master mark it won't do i've got you and i mean to stick to you you know what a tactless beggar i can be when i like seriously do you think i can't see there's something wrong i'm hanged if i think it's safe to let you go about alone while you're looking like this it isn't any any hitch at kensington park gardens is it and there was a real anxiety in his tone as he asked this no said mark shortly it's not that have you got into any trouble then any scrape you don't see your way out of you might do worse than tell me all about it there's nothing to tell said mark goaded past prudence by his persistence it's only a letter a rather important letter which i brought out here to read quietly why the deuce couldn't you say so before cried caffyn i won't interrupt you read your letter by all means and i'll walk up and down here till you're ready for me only don't make me think you want to cut me you might wait till you're married for that and you ought to know very well if you don't why i've been obliged as it is to decline the invitation to the marriage feast mark saw that for some reason caffyn did not mean to be shaken off just then and as he could bear the suspense no longer and knew that to walk about with caffyn and talk indifferently of his coming happiness with that letter unread in his pocket would drive him mad he had no choice but to accept the compromise so he went to the bench and began to open the letter with trembling hands while caffyn paced up and down at a discreet distance i see what it is now he thought as he noticed the foreign envelope i'm uncommonly glad i came up just then will he go through with it after this will he tell me anything i wonder very little i fancy of what i know already we shall see this was the letter which mark read while the northeast wind roared through the boughs overhead driving the gritty shell dust in his face and making the thin paper in his fingers flap with its vicious jerks talipot bungalow Nura elia ceylon my dear mark i am not going to reproach you for your long silence as i dare say you waited for me to write first i have been intending to write again and again and have been continually prevented but i hardly expected to hear from you unless you had anything of importance to tell me something however has just come to my knowledge here which makes me fancy that you might have other reasons for not writing what does he mean by that thought mark in sudden terror and for a moment dared not read on have you by some strange chance been led to believe that i was on board the unfortunate mangalore at the time of the disaster because i see on looking over some old indian papers at the club here that my name appears on the list of missing as a matter of fact i left the ship at bombay i arranged to spend a day or two with some people old friends of my father's who have a villa on the malabar hill but on my arrival there found a telegram from ceylon warning me to lose no time if i wished to see my father alive the mangalore was to stop several more days at bombay and i decided to go on at once overland to madras and take my chances there of a steamer for colombo leaving my host to send down word to the ship of my change of plan i can only suppose that there was some misunderstanding about this and even then i cannot understand how the steward could have returned me as on board under the circumstances but if only the mistake has given you no distress it is not of much consequence as i wrote since my arrival here to the only other quarter in which the report might have caused alarm to continue my story i was fortunate enough to catch a boat at madras and so reached colombo some time before the mangalore was due there and as i went on at once to yatagala it is not to be wondered at if in that remote part of the country up in adapusilava in the hill district it was long before i even heard of the wreck there was not much society there as you may imagine the neighbouring estates being mostly held by native planters or managers with whom my father had never even when well been at all intimate 
well my poor father rallied a little and lingered for some time after my arrival his condition required my constant care and i hope i was able to be of some comfort to him when he died i thought it best to do what i could with the overseer's assistance to carry on the plantation until there was a good opportunity of disposing of it and for a time it did seem as if my efforts were going to be rewarded the life was hard and lonely enough but it had its charms for a solitary man like myself then everything seemed to go wrong at once we had a bad season to begin with and next fungus suddenly showed itself on the estate and soon spread to such an extent that as a coffee plantation the place is quite worthless now though i dare say they will be able to grow tea or kinchona on it i have done with yatagala myself having just succeeded in getting rid of it naturally not for a very large price per acre but still i shall have enough altogether to live upon if i decide to carry on my old profession or to start me fairly in some other line but i am coming home first i can't call this island lovely as most of it is home there is nothing to keep me here any longer except my health which has been anything but good for the last few months i have been down with fever after fever and this place which i was ordered to as a health resort is too damp and chilly to get really well in so i shall make an effort to leave in about a fortnight by the p and o coromandel which they tell me is a comfortable boat after my experience of the mangalore i prefer to trust this time to the regular liners i write this chiefly to ask you to do me a kindness if you possibly can i have a sort of longing to see a friendly face on landing and lately i have come to persuade myself that after all you may have good news to meet me with can you come i have no timetables here but i calculate that the ship will reach plymouth some time during the easter holidays so that even if you are still in st peter's your school duties will not prevent your coming you can easily get the exact time we arrive by inquiring at the p and o offices in leadnall street we shall meet so soon now that i need write no more as it is there is another letter i must write if i can for you would hardly believe how difficult i find it to write at all in my present state though a sea voyage will set me up again the letter ended rather abruptly the writing becoming almost illegible towards the close as if the writer's strength had gradually failed him mark came to the end with a feeling that was almost relief his chief dread had been to hear that he was found out and that his exposure might be made public before he could make mabel his own it was terrible to know that the man he had injured was alive but still it was something that he was still unaware of his injury it was a respite and to a man of mark's temperament that was much even if holroyd was strong enough to take his passage by the coromandel he could hardly be in england for at least another fortnight and long before he arrived at plymouth the wedding would have taken place and in a fortnight he might be able to hit upon something to soften some of the worst aspects of his fraud the change in the title of the book in the nom de plume and even the alterations of the text might be explained but then there was that fatal concession of allowing his real name to appear it was he knew to be placed on the title page of the latest edition would there be time to suppress that this occurred to him but vaguely for it seemed just then as if when mabel were once his wife no calamity could have power to harm him and now nothing holroyd could do would prevent the marriage after that the deluge so he was almost his usual self as he rose and came towards caffin his hand however still trembled a little causing him to bungle in replacing the letter and drop the envelope which the other obligingly picked up and restored to him ashburn my dear fellow he began as they walked on together i hope you won't think me impertinent but i couldn't help seeing the writing on that envelope and it seems to me i knew it at once and yet do you mind telling me if it's from any one i know mark would of course have preferred to say nothing but it seemed best on the whole to avoid suspicion by telling the truth caffin as a friend of vincent's would hear it before long it might look odd if he made any secret of it now and so he told the tale of the escape much as the letter had given it 
his companion was delighted he laughed with pleasure and congratulated mark on the joy he supposed him to feel until the latter could hardly bear it who would have hoped for this he said when we were talking about the dead coming to life some time ago eh and yet it's happened poor dear old vincent and you say he's coming home soon very soon in about a fortnight said mark he he wants me to go down to plymouth and meet him but of course i can't do that a fortnight cried caffyn capital but how do you make it out though easily said mark he talks of coming by the coromandel and starting about a fortnight after he wrote so i see said caffyn i suppose you've looked at the date no then let me look here it's more than five weeks old look at the postmark why it's been in england nearly a fortnight it was delayed at my people's said mark not seeing the importance of this at first that's how it was but but don't you see caffyn said excitedly for him if he really has sailed by this coromandel he must be very near now he might even be in plymouth by this time good god groaned mark losing all control as the truth flashed upon him while the grey grass heaved under his unstable feet caffyn was watching him with a certain curiosity which was not without a malicious amusement you didn't expect that he said it's capital isn't it capital murmured mark you'll be in time for your wedding pursued caffyn yes said mark heavily you'll be in time for that now yes his doom was advancing upon him fast and he must wait patiently for it to fall he was tied down without possibility of escape unless he abandoned all hope of mabel perhaps he might as well do that first as last well said caffyn what are you going to do about it do echoed mark what can i do i shall see him soon enough i suppose that's a composed way of expecting a long-lost friend certainly said caffyn laughing can't you understand retorted mark that that situated as i am coming at such a time as this even a man's dearest friend might be might be rather in the way why of course i never thought of that shows how dull i'm getting he will be in the way deucedly in the way if he comes after all though he may not come let us find out said mark surely there's a way of finding out oh yes said caffyn i dare say they can tell us at the offices we'll have a cab and drive there now and then we shall know what to do lednor street isn't it they walked sharply across to the bayswater road where they could get a hansom and as they drove along towards the city mark's hopes began to rise perhaps holroyd was not on board the coromandel and then he tried to prepare himself for the contrary how should he receive vincent when he came for of course he would seek him out at once the desperate idea of throwing himself on his friend's mercy occurred to him if he could be the first to tell holroyd the truth surely he would consent to arrange the matter without any open scandal he would not wish to ruin him so long as he received his own again both caffyn and mark were very silent during that long and wearisome drive with its frequent blocks in the crowded city thoroughfares and when they arrived at last at the courtyard in front of the offices mark said to his companion you manage this will you for he felt quite unequal to the task himself they had to wait some time at a broad mahogany counter before a clerk was at liberty to attend to them for the office was full of people making various inquiries or paying passage money mark cursed the deliberation with which the man before them was choosing his berth on the cabin plan submitted to him but at last the precautions against the screw and the engines and the kitchens were all taken and the clerk proceeded to answer caffyn's questions in the fullest and most obliging manner he went with them to the telegram boards by the doors and after consulting a dispatch announcing the coromandel departure from gibraltar said that she would probably be at plymouth by the next evening or early the following morning now find out if he's on board her said mark and his heart almost stopped when the clerk came back with a list of passengers 
and ran his finger down the names. V. B. Holroyd, is that your friend? If you think of meeting him at Plymouth, you have only to see our agents there, and they will let you know when the tender goes out to take the passengers ashore. After that, Mark made his way out blindly, followed by Caffin. Let us talk here. It's quieter, said the latter, when they were in the courtyard again. What's the good of talking? said Mark. Don't you think you ought to go down to Plymouth? suggested Caffin. No, said Mark. I don't. How can I now? Oh, I know you're wanted for exhibition and all that, but you could plead business for one day. What is the use? said Mark. He will come to see me as soon as he gets to town. No, he won't, my boy, said Caffin. He will go and see the Langtons even before such a devoted friend as you are. Didn't you know he was like one of the family there? I have heard them mention him, said the unhappy Mark on whom a dreadful vision had flashed of Holroyd, learning the truth by some innocent remark of Mabel's. "'I—I uh, I didn't know they were intimate.' "'Oh, yes,' said Caffin. "'They'll make a tremendous fuss over him. "'Now, look here, my dear fellow. "'Let's talk this over without any confounded sentiment. "'Here's your wedding at hand, "'and here's a long-lost intimate friend about to turn up in the midst of it. "'You'd very much prefer him to stay away.' "'There's nothing to be ashamed of in that. "'I should myself if I were in your shoes. "'No fellow cares about playing second fiddle at his own wedding. "'Now I've got a little suggestion to make. "'I was going down to Wastwater tomorrow, "'but I wouldn't much mind waiting another day "'if I could only get a fellow to come with me. "'I always liked Holroyd, you know. "'Capital good chap he is. "'And if you leave me to manage him, "'I believe I could get him to come.' I own I rather funk Wastwater all alone at this time of year. He wouldn't go, said Mark hopelessly. He would go there, as readily as anywhere else, if you left him to me. I tell you what, he added, as if the idea had just occurred to him. Suppose I go down to Plymouth and catch him there. I don't mind the journey a bit. No, said Mark, I am going to meet him. I must be the first to see him. After that, if he likes to go away with you, he can. Then you are going down after all, said Caffin. What are you going to say to him? That is my affair, said Mark. Oh, I beg pardon. I only meant that if you say anything to him about this wedding, or even let him think the Langtons are in town, I may as well give up any idea of getting him to come away with me. Look here, you might do me a good turn, particularly when you know you won't be sorry to get him off your hands yourself. Tell him you're going abroad in a day or two. That's true, you're going to Switzerland for your honeymoon, you know. And let him think the Langtons are away somewhere on the continent. It's all for his good. He'll want mountain air and a cheerful companion like me to put him right again. He'll be the first to laugh at an innocent little deception like that. But Mark had done with deceptions, as he told himself. "'I shall tell him what I think he ought to know,' he said firmly. And Caffin, with all his keenness, mistook the purpose in his mind. "'I'll take that for an answer,' he said, "'and I shan't leave town to-morrow on the chance of his being able to go.' And so they parted. "'Ought I to have let him see that I knew?' Caffin was thinking when he was alone again. "'No, I don't want to frighten him. "'I think he will play my game without it.' "'Mark went back to the Langtons and dined there. "'Afterwards he told Mabel privately "'that he would be obliged to leave town for a day or two "'on pressing business. "'There was no mistaking his extreme reluctance to go, "'and she understood that only the sternest necessity "'took him away at such a time, "'trusting him too entirely to ask any questions. "'But as they parted, she said, "'It's only for two days, Mark, isn't it?' "'Only for two days,' he answered. "'And soon we shall be together, you and I, for all our lives,' she said softly, with a great happiness in her low tones. "'I ought to be able to give you up for just two days, Mark.' Before those two days were over, he thought, she might give him up for ever, and the thought that this was possible made it difficult for him to part, as if all were well. He went back and passed a sleepless night, thinking over the humiliating task he had set himself. 
his only chance of keeping mabel now lay in making a full confession to holroyd of his perfidy he would offer a complete restitution in time he would plead so earnestly that his friend must forgive him or at least consent to stay his hand for the present he would humble himself to any extent if that would keep him from losing mabel altogether anything but that if he lost her now the thought of the happiness he had missed so narrowly would drive him mad it was a miserably cold day when he left paddington and he shivered under his rug as he sat in the train he could hardly bear the cheerful talk of meeting or parting friends at the various stations at which the train stopped he would have welcomed a collision which would deal him a swift and painless death and free him from the misery he had brought upon himself he would have been glad like the lover in the last ride together although for very different reasons if the world could end that day and his guilt be swallowed up in the sum of iniquity but no collision occurred and as it is perhaps unnecessary to add the universe did not gratify him by dissolving on that occasion the train brought him safely to the plymouth platform and left him there to face his difficulty alone it was about six o'clock in the evening and he lost no time in inquiring at his hotel for the p and o agents and making his way to their offices up the stony streets and along a quiet lane over the hill by hogate he was received with courtesy and told all that he wished to know the coromandel was not in yet would not be in now until after dark if then they would send him word if the tender was to go out the next morning said the agent as he wrote him the necessary order to go on board her after that mark went back to the hotel and dined or rather attempted to dine in the big coffee-room by the side of a blazing fire that was powerless to thaw the cold about his heart and then he retired to the smoking-room which he had all to himself and where he sat staring grimly at the leather benches and cold marble-topped tables around him while he could hear muffled music and applause from the theatre hard by varied by the click of the balls in the billiard-room at the end of the corridor presently the waiter announced a messenger for him and on going out into the hall he found a man of seafaring appearance who brought him a card stating that the tender would leave the mill bay pier at six the next morning by which time the coromandel would most probably be in mark went up to his bedroom that night as to a condemned cell he dreaded another night of sleepless tossing sleep came to him however merciful and dreamless as it will sometimes to those in desperate case but he yielded to it with terror as he felt it coming upon him for it brought the morning nearer End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of the giant's robe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the giant's robe by f anstey on board the coromandel it was quite dark the next morning when the hammering of the boots outside the door roused mark to a miserable sense of the unwelcome duty before him he dressed by candlelight and groping his way down the silent staircase hunted about in the shuttered coffee-room for the coat and hat he had left there and went shivering out into the main street from which he turned up the hill towards the hoe the day had dawned by that time and the sky was a gloomy grey varied towards the horizon by stormy gleams of yellow the prim clean streets were deserted save by an occasional workman going to his labours with a heavy tramp echoing on the wet flags mark went along by terraces of lodging-houses where the placards of apartments had an especially forlorn and futile look against the drawn blinds and from the areas of which the exhalations confined during the night rose in perceptible contrast with the fresh morning air then he found himself upon the hoe with its broad asphalt promenades and rows of hotels and terraces rain-washed silent and cold and descending the winding series of steps he made his way to the millbay pier 
and entered the customs house gates waiting about the wharf was a little knot of people apparently bound on much the same errand as himself although in far higher spirits their cheerfulness probably a trifle aggravated by the consciousness of being up so early jarred upon him and he went on past them to the place where two small steamers were lying one of em's going out to the coromandel presently said a sailor in answer to his question you better wait till the agent's down or you may be took out to the wrong ship for there's two expected but they ain't neither of em in yet ah as a gun was heard outside that'll be the coromandel signalling now that ain't her said another man who was leaning over the side of one of the tenders that's for t'other one the emu the coromandel's a three-master she is tom knows the coromandel don't you tom let tom alone for knowing the coromandel said the first sailor a remark which apparently was rich in hidden suggestion for they both laughed very heartily presently the agent appeared and mark having satisfied himself that there was no danger of being taken out to the wrong vessel for much as he dreaded meeting holroyd he dreaded missing him even more went on board one of the tenders which soon after began to move out into the dull green water now that he was committed to the ordeal his terrors rose again he almost wished that he had made a mistake after all and was being taken out to meet the wrong p and o the horrible fear possessed him that holroyd might in some way have learned his secret on the voyage home suppose for instance a fellow passenger possessed the copy of illusion and chanced to lend it to him what should he do if his friend were to meet him with a stern and contemptuous repulse rendering all conciliation out of the question tortured by speculations like these he kept nervously away from the others on board and paced restlessly up and down near the bows he saw nothing consciously then but afterwards every detail of those terrible ten minutes came back to him vividly down to the lights still hanging in the rigging of the vessels in harbour and the hoarse cries of the men in a brown sailed lugger gliding past them out to sea out by the bar there was a light haze in the mists of which lay the long black hull of the coromandel and to this the tender worked round in a tedious curve preparatory to lying alongside as they passed under the stern mark nerved himself to look amongst the few figures in the gangway for the face he feared but holroyd was not amongst them after several unsuccessful attempts of a lascar to catch the rope thrown from the tender accompanied by some remarks in a foreign language on his part which may have been offered in polite excuse for his awkwardness the rope was secured at length the tender brought against the vessel's side and the gangway lashed across then followed a short delay during which the p and o captain in rough weather costume conversed with the agent across the rails with a certain condescension thick as a hedge outside mark heard him say haven't turned in all night what are we all waiting for now here quartermaster just ask the doctor to step forward will you somehow at the mention of the doctor holroyd's allusions to his illness recurred to mark's mind and hopes he dared not confess even to himself so base and vile were they rose in his heart here's the doctor clean bill of health eh doctor asked the agent and mark held his breath for the answer all well on board tumble in then and there was an instant rush across the gangway mark followed some of the crowd down into the saloon where the steward was laying breakfast but he could not see holroyd there either and for a few minutes was pent up in a corner in the general bustle which prevailed there were glad greetings going on all around him confused questions and answers rapid directions to which no one had any time to attend and now and then an angry exclamation over the eagerly read letters and where's mother living now we've lost that seven forty express all through that infernal tender look here don't take that bag up on deck to get wet d'ye hear jolly to be back in the old place again eh i wish i'd never left it that scoundrel has gone and thrown all those six houses into chancery and so on those of the passengers who were not talking or reading being engaged in filling up the telegraph forms 
brought on board for their convenience mark extricated himself from the hubbub as soon as he could and got hold of the steward there was a gentleman on board of the name of holroyd he seemed well enough as far as the steward knew though a bit poorly when he first came aboard to be sure he was in his berth just then getting his things together to go ashore but he'd be up on deck directly half sick and half glad at this additional delay mark left the saloon and lingered listlessly about above watching the lascars hauling up baggage from the hold they would have been interesting enough to him at any other time with their seamed bilious complexions of every degree of swarthiness set off by the touches of colour in their sashes and head coverings their strange cries and still more uncouth jocularity but he soon tired of them and wandered aft where the steamer chairs their usefulness at an end for that voyage were huddled together dripping and forlorn on the damp red deck he was still standing by them idly turning over the labels attached to their backs and reading the names thereon without the slightest real curiosity when he heard a well-remembered voice behind him crying mark my dear fellow so you've come after all i was half afraid you wouldn't think it worth your while i can't tell you how glad i am to see you and he turned with a guilty start to face the man he had wronged evidently thought mark he knows nothing yet or he wouldn't meet me like this and he gripped the cordial hand held out to him with convulsive force his face was white and his lips trembled he could not speak such unexpected emotion on his part touched and gratified holroyd who patted him on the shoulder affectionately it's all right old boy i understand he said so you did think i was gone after all well this is a greater pleasure to me than ever it can be to you i never expected to see you again said mark as soon as he could speak even now i can hardly believe it i'm quite real however said holroyd laughing there's more of me now than when they carried me on board from colombo don't look so alarmed the voyage has brought me round again i'm my old self again as a matter of fact there was a great change in him his bearded face still burnt by the ceylon sun was lined and wasted his expression had lost its old dreaminess and when he did not smile was sterner and more set than it had been his manner as mark noticed later had a new firmness and decision he looked a man who could be mercilessly severe in a just cause and even his evident affection was powerless to reassure mark the hatches had by this time been closed over the hold again and the crane unshipped the warning bell was ringing for the departure of the tender though the passengers still lingered till the last minute as if a little reluctant after all to desert the good ship that had been their whole world of late the reigning beauty of the voyage who was to remain with the vessel until her arrival at gravesend was receiving her last compliments during prolonged and complicated leave-takings in which however the exhilaration of most of her courtiers now that their leave or furlough was really about to begin was too irrepressible for sentiment a last delay at the gangway where the captain and ship's officers were being overwhelmed with thanks and friendly good-byes and then the deck was cleared at last the gangway taken in and the rail refastened and as the tender steamed off all the jokes and allusions which formed the accumulated wit of the voyage flashed out with a brief and final brilliancy until the hearty cheering given and returned drowned them for ever on the tender such acquaintances as holroyd had made during the voyage gave mark no chance of private conversation with him and even when they had landed and cleared the custom house mark made no use of his opportunity he knew he must speak soon but he could not tell him just then and accordingly put off the evil hour by affecting an intense interest in the minor incidents of the voyage and in vincent's experiences of a planter's life it was the same in the hotel coffee-room where some of the coromandel's passengers were breakfasting near them and the conversation became general after breakfast however mark proposed to spend some time in seeing the place an arrangement which he thought would lead the way to confession but holroyd would not hear of this 
he seemed possessed by a feverish impatience to get to london without delay and very soon they were pacing the plymouth railway platform together waiting for the up train mark oppressed by the gloomy conviction that if he did not speak soon the favourable moment would pass away never to return where do you think of going when you first get in he asked in dread of the answer i don't know said holroyd the great western i suppose is the nearest you mustn't go to an hotel said mark won't you come to my rooms i don't live with my people any longer you know and i can easily put you up he was thinking that this arrangement would give him a little more time for his confession thanks said holroyd gratefully it's very kind of you to think of that old fellow i will come to you then but there is a house i must go to as soon as we get in if you won't mind if i run away for an hour or two will you mark remembered what caffyn had said there'll be plenty of time for that to-morrow won't there he said nervously no said holroyd impatiently i can't wait i daren't i have let so much time go by already you will understand when i tell you all about it mark i can't rest till i know whether there is still a chance of happiness left for me or or whether i have come too late and the dream is over in that letter which had fallen into caffyn's hands holroyd had told mabel the love he had concealed so long he had begged her not to decide too hastily he would wait any time for her answer he said if she did not feel able to give it at once and in the meantime she should be troubled by no further importunities on his part this was not perhaps the most judicious promise to make he had given it from an impulse of consideration for her being well aware that she had never looked upon him as a possible lover and that his declaration would come upon her with a certain shock perhaps too he wanted to leave himself a margin of hope as long as possible to make his exile endurable since for months if no answer came back to him he could cheat himself with the thought that such silence was favourable in itself but even when he came to regret his promise he shrank from risking all by breaking it then came his long illness and the discovery at newera elia for the first time he thought that there might be other explanations of the delay and while he was writing the letter which had come to mark he resolved to make one more appeal to mabel since it might be that his first by some evil chance had failed to reach her that second appeal however was never made before he could do more than begin it the fever he had never wholly shaken off seized him again and laid him helpless until when he was able to write once more he was already on his way to plead for himself but the dread lest his own punctilious folly and timidity had closed the way to his heart's desire had grown deeper and deeper and he felt an impulse now which was stronger than his natural reserve to speak of it to some one yes he continued she may have thought i was drowned as you did perhaps she has never dreamed how much she is to me if i could only hope to tell her that even now do you mind telling me her name said mark with a deadly foreboding of what was coming did i ever speak of the langtons to you said holroyd i think i must have done she is a miss langton mabel her name is he dwelt on the name with a lover's tenderness some day if if it is all well you may see her i hope oddly enough i believe she has heard your name rather often she has a small brother who used to be in your form at st peter's did i never tell you never said mark he felt that fate was too hard for him he had honestly meant to confess all up to that moment he had thought to found his strongest plea for forbearance on his approaching marriage how could he do that now what mercy could he expect from a rival he was lost if he was mad enough to arm holroyd with such a weapon he was lost in any case for it was certain that the weapon would not lie hidden long there were four days still before the wedding time enough for the mind to explode what could he do how could he keep the other in the dark or get rid of him before he could do any harm and then caffyn's suggestions came back to him 
was it possible to make use of caffyn's desire for a travelling companion and turn it to his own purpose if caffyn was so anxious to have holroyd with him in the lakes why not let him it was a desperate chance enough but it was the only one left to him if it failed it would ruin him but that would certainly happen if he let things take their course if it succeeded mabel would at least be his his resolution was taken in an instant and carried out with a strategy that gave him a miserable surprise at finding himself so thorough a judas by the way he said i've just thought of something harold caffin is a friend of mine i know he wants to see you again and he could tell you all you want to hear about about the langtons i've heard him mention them often enough you see you don't even know where they are yet i'll wire and ask him to meet us at my room shall i that's a capital idea cried holroyd caffin is sure to know do it at once like a good fellow you stay here then and look out for the train said mark as he hurried to the telegraph office leaving holroyd thinking how thoughtful and considerate his once selfish friend had become mark sent the telegram which ended he knows nothing yet i leave him to you when he returned he found that holroyd had secured an empty compartment in the train which was preparing to start and mark got in with a heavy apprehension of the danger of a long journey alone with holroyd he tried to avoid conversation by sheltering himself by a local journal while at every stoppage he prayed that a stranger might come to his rescue he read nothing until a paragraph copied from a london literary paper caught his eye we understand the paragraph ran that the new novel by the author of illusion mr cyril ernstone or rather mr mark ashburn as he has now declared himself will be published early in the present spring and it is rumoured that the second work will show a marked advance on its predecessor it was merely the usual puff preliminary though mark took it as a prediction and at any other time would have glowed with anticipated triumph now it only struck him with terror was it in holroyd's paper too suppose he asked to look at mark's and saw it there and questioned him as of course he would what should he say thinking to avoid this as far as possible he crumpled up the tell-tale paper and hurled it out of the window but this act had precisely the opposite effect for holroyd took it as an indication that his companion was ready for conversation and put down the paper he had been pretending to read mark he began with a slight hesitation and with his first words mark knew that the question was coming which he dreaded more than anything he had no notion how he should reply to it beyond a general impression that he would have to lie and lie hard mark said holroyd again i didn't like to worry you about it before i thought perhaps you would speak of it first but but have you never heard anything more of that ambitious attempt of mine at a novel you needn't mind telling me i i can't tell you mark said looking away out of the window i don't expect anything good said holroyd i never thought why should i be such a humbug i did think sometimes more lately perhaps that it wouldn't be an utter failure i see i was wrong well if i was ambitious it was rather for her than myself and if she cares for me what else matters to either of us tell me all about it you you remember what happened to the first volume of the french revolution began mark go on said holroyd it the book yours i mean said mark he could not remember the original title was burnt where at the office did they write and tell you so had they read it mark felt he was among pitfalls not at the office he said at my rooms my old rooms it came back then yes it came back the, there was no letter with it the girl at the lodgings found the manuscript lying about she she burnt it the lies sprang in ready succession from his brain at the critical moment without any other preparation than the emergency as lies did with mark ashburn till lately he had hoped that the truth might come and he loathed himself now for this fresh piece of treachery but it had saved him for the present 
and he could not abandon it. "'I thought it would at least have been safe with you,' said Holroyd. "'If you—' "'No, my dear fellow, I didn't mean to reproach you. I can see how cut up you are about it. And, after all, it was only a rejected manuscript. The girl only hastened its course a little. Carlyle rewrote his work. But then, I'm not Carlyle. We won't say anything any more about it, eh, old fellow? It's only one dream over.' Mark was seized with a remorse which almost drove him to confess all, and take the consequences. But Holroyd had sunk back to his position by the window again, and there was a fixed frown on his face which, although it only arose from painful thought, effectually deterred Mark from speaking. He felt now that everything depended on Caffin. He sat looking furtively at the other now and then, and thinking what terrible reproaches those firm lips might utter how differently the sad kind eyes might regard him before long and once more he longed for a railroad crash which would set him free from his tangled life the journey ended at last and they drove down to south audley street vincent was very silent in spite of his philosophical bearing he felt the blow deeply he had come back with ideas of a possible literary career before him and it was hard to resign them all at once it was rather late in the afternoon when they arrived, and Caffin was there to receive them. He was delighted to welcome Holroyd, and his cordiality restored the other to cheerfulness. It is so pleasant to find that one is not forgotten, and so rare. When Vincent had gone upstairs to see his sleeping room, Caffin turned to Mark. There was a kind of grin on his face, and yet a certain admiration, too. "'I got your telegram,' he said so so you've brought yourself to part with him after all i thought over what you said returned mark and and he told me something which would make it very awkward and and painful for him and for myself too if he remained you haven't told him anything then still nothing said mark then said caffin i think i shall not be alone at waswater after all if you'll only let me manage was Mark at all surprised at the languid Harold Caffin exerting himself in this way? If he was, he was too grateful for the phenomenon to care very much about seeking to explain it. Caffin was a friend of his. He had divined that Holroyd's return was inconvenient. Very likely he had known of Vincent's hopeless attachment for Mabel, and he was plainly anxious to get a companion at the lakes. Any one of these was motive enough. Soon after, Holroyd joined them in the sitting-room. Caffin, after more warm congratulations and eager questioning, broached the Waswater scheme. "'You may as well,' he concluded. "'London's beastly at this time of year. You're looking as if the voyage hadn't done you much good, too, and it will be grand in the mountains just now. Come with me by the early train to-morrow. You've no packing to do. I'm sure we shall pull together all right.' "'I'm sure of that,' said Vincent. "'And if I had nothing to keep me in town—' but i've not seen the langtons yet you know and um, by the by you can tell me where i shall find them now i suppose they have not moved now i've got you laughed caffin if the langtons are the only obstacle you can't go and see them for the very good reason that they're away abroad somewhere are they all there every one of em even the father i fancy just now do you know when they're likely to be back i haven't heard said caffin calmly they must come back soon, you see, for the lovely Mabel's wedding. Mark held his breath as he listened. What was Caffin going to say next? Vincent's face altered suddenly. Then Mabel, Miss Langton, is going to be married, he asked in a curiously quiet tone. Rather, said Caffin. Brilliant match in its way, I understand. Not much money on his side, but one of the coming literary fellows, and all that kind of thing, you know. Just the man for that sort of girl. Didn't you know about it? No, said Holroyd uneasily. He was standing with his elbow on the mantelpiece, with his face turned from the other two. I didn't know. What is his name? Upon my soul, I forget. Heard it somewhere. "'Ashburn, you don't happen to know it, do you?' "'I?' cried Mark, shrinking. "'No, I—I I haven't heard.' "'Well,' continued Caffin, "'it isn't of much consequence, is it? "'I shall hit upon it soon, I dare say. 
They say she's deucedly fond of him, though. Can't fancy disdainful Miss Mabel condescending to be deucedly fond of any one. But so they tell me. And I say, Holroyd, to come back to the point, is there any reason why you should stay in town? None, said Holroyd, with pain ringing in his voice. None in the world why I should stay anywhere now. Well, won't you come with me? I start the first thing tomorrow. It will do you good. It's kind of you to ask, said Vincent, but I can't desert Ashburn in that way after he took the trouble to come down and meet me. We've not seen one another for so long, have we, Mark? Caffin smiled in spite of himself. Why, didn't he tell you? he said. He's arranged to go abroad himself in a day or two. Vincent glanced round at Mark, who stood there, the personification of embarrassment and shame. "'I see,' he said, with a change in his voice. "'I shall only be in the way, then.' Mark said nothing. He could not. "'Well, Caffin, I'll come with you. The lakes will do as well as any other place for the short time I shall be in England.' "'Then you haven't come home for good?' inquired Caffin. "'For good? No, not exactly.' he replied bitterly plantation life has unsettled me you see i shall have to go back to it to ceylon cried mark with hopes that had grown quite suddenly was it could it be possible that the threatened storm was going to pass away not for a time but altogether anywhere said holroyd what does it matter there's a man i know observed caffin who's going out to a coffee estate somewhere in southern India. The Anamali Hills, I think he said. He was wanting someone with a little experience to go out with him the other day. He's a rattling good fellow, too. Gilroy, his name is. I don't know if you'd care to meet him. You might think it good enough to join him, at all events, for a trial. Yes, said Holroyd listlessly. I may as well see him. Well, said Caffin, he's at Liverpool just now, I believe. I can write to him and tell him about you, and ask him to come over and meet us somewhere, and then you could settle all about it, you know, if you like the look of him. It's very good of you to take all this trouble, said Vincent, gratefully. Bosh, said Caffin, using that modern form for polite repudiation of gratitude. No trouble at all. Looks rather as if I wanted to get rid of you, don't you know? Gilroy's going out so very soon is he said vincent he had no suspicions mabel's engagement seemed only too probable and he knew that he had never had any claim upon her but for all that he had no intention of taking the fact entirely upon trust he would not leave england till he had seen her and learned from her own lips that he must give up hope for ever after that the sooner he went the better you needn't go out with him unless you want to you might join him later there but of course you wouldn't take anything for granted nothing still if you did care to go out at once i suppose you've nothing in the way of preparations to hinder you eh no said vincent it would only be transferring my trunks from one ship to another but i-i don't feel well enough to go out just yet of course not said caffin you must have a week or two of mountain air first then you'll be ready to go anywhere but i must have you at wastwater he added with a laughing look of intelligence at mark whose soul rose against all this duplicity and subsided again how wonderfully everything was working out unless some fatality interposed between then and the next morning the man he dreaded would be safely buried in the wildest part of the lake district he might even go off to India again and never learn the wrong he had suffered. At all events, Mark was saved for a time. He was thankful, deeply thankful, now that he had resisted that mad impulse to confession. Vincent had dropped into an armchair with his back to the window, brooding over his shattered ambitions. All his proud self-confidence in his ability to win fame for the woman he loved was gone now. He felt that he had neither the strength nor the motive to try again. If, if this he had heard was true, he must be an exile, with lower aims and a blanker life than those he had once hoped for. All at once Mark, as he stood at the window with Caffin, stepped back with a look of helpless terror. "'What the deuce is it now?' said the other under his breath. Mark caught Caffin's elbow with a fierce grip. 
a carriage had driven up they could see it plainly still in the afternoon light which had only just begun to fade do you see muttered mark thickly she's in it she looked up she saw me caffin himself was evidently disturbed not not mabel he whispered worse it's dolly and she'll come up she'll see him the two stood there staring blankly at each other while holroyd was still too absorbed to have the least suspicion that the future happiness or misery of himself and others was trembling just there in the balance End of chapter 29chapter thirty of the giant's shrove this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the giant's robe by f anstey chapter thirty the way of transgressors dolly's mere appearance in the room would lead vincent to suspect that he had been deceived her first words would almost inevitably expose the fraud she was coming up nevertheless and mark felt powerless to prevent her he could only indulge himself in inwardly cursing caffyn's ingenuity and his own weakness for having brought him to such a pass as this caffyn was shaken for the moment but he soon recovered himself keep cool will you he whispered he might have shouted for vincent saw and heard nothing just then you stay here and keep him amused don't let him go near the window then he added aloud i'll go and see if i can find that bradshaw almost certain i didn't bring it with me but if you saw it there why and he was gone mark caught up a paper with a rapid oh i say vincent did you see this correspondence about competitive examinations of course you haven't though just listen then it's rather amusing and he began to read with desperate animation a string of letters on a subject which in the absence of worthier sport was just then being trailed before the public the newspaper hid his face and while he read he could strain his ears for the first sign of dolly's approach she had seen him he was sure and she would insist upon coming up she was so fond of him he wished now he had gone down himself instead of leaving it to caffin meanwhile the latter had rushed down in time to wave back the maid who was coming to the door and which he opened himself dolly was standing there alone on the doorsteps she had prepared a polite little formula for the servant and was therefore disappointed to see caffin why it's you she said in rather an injured tone you never expected such luck as that did you said caffin is there anything i can do for your ladyship mabel asked me to drive round this way and ask if mark has come back there's fräulein in the carriage too but i wanted to ask all by myself pray step this way said caffin leading the way with mock politeness to a little sitting-room on the ground floor i can't stay long said dolly mark isn't here i saw his face at the window upstairs mabel told me to see if he was quite well and i want to ask him how he is and where he's been afraid you can't see him just now said caffin he's got someone with him he hasn't seen for a long time we mustn't disturb him tell mabel he'll come to-morrow and he's quite well dolly was preparing to go when she discovered some portmanteaus and boxes in a corner what a funny box with all those red tickets on it she said oh and a big white helmet it's green inside is mark going to be married in that thing harold all at once she stopped short in her examination why why they've got poor vincent's name on them they have look and caffin realized that he had been too ingenious he had forgotten all about this luggage in showing dolly to that room in his fear lest her voice should be too audible in the passage there there you're keeping fräulein waiting all this time never mind about the luggage he said hurriedly good-bye dolly sorry you can't stop but i can stop objected dolly who was not easily got rid of at the best of times harold i'm sure that dear vincent has come alive again 
he's the somebody mark hasn't seen for a long time oh if it really is i must go and see caffyn saw his best course now was the hazardous one of telling the truth well he said as it happens you're right vincent was not drowned and he is here but i don't advise you to go to see him for all that why said dolly with her joy suddenly checked she scarcely knew why he's in a fearful rage with you just now said caffyn he's found out about that letter that letter you burnt mabel said i was never to worry about that horrid letter any more and i'm not going to so it's no use your trying to make me said dolly defiantly and then as her fears grew she added what about that letter well said caffyn it appears that the letter you tore the stamp off was from vincent it had a foreign stamp i remember and it was very important he never got an answer and he found out somehow that it was because you burnt it and then my goodness dolly what a rage he was in i don't care said dolly mabel will tell vincent how it was she knows ah but you see she don't know said caffyn do you suppose if she had known who the letter was from and what it was about she would have taken it so quietly why she thinks it was only an old envelope you burnt i heard her say so you know she still believes vincent is dead she doesn't know the truth yet but vincent will tell her are you coming up to see him no said dolly trembling ah uh, i think i won't not to-day wise child said caffyn approvingly between ourselves dolly poor vincent has come back in such a queer state that he's not fit to see any one just yet and we're dreadfully afraid of his meeting mabel and frightening her oh don't let him come don't cried terrified dolly well i'll tell you what we've done i got mark to agree to it we haven't told him that you're any of you at home at all he thinks you're all away and he's coming with me into the country to-morrow so unless you tell mabel you've seen him oh but i won't i don't want her to know not now said dolly oh and i was so glad when i first heard of this is he is he very angry harold i don't advise you to come near him just yet he said you won't tell fräulein of course i'll see you to the carriage how do fräulein home i suppose and the last thing he saw was dolly's frightened glance up at the window as the carriage drove off she won't tell this time he said to himself and indeed poor dolly was silent enough all the way home and met fräulein moser's placid stream of talk with short and absent answers that evening however in the schoolroom she roused herself to express a sudden interest in colin's stamp album which she coaxed him to show her as he was turning over the pages one by one she stopped him suddenly what is that one she said pointing out a green-coloured stamp amongst the colonial varieties can't you read said colin a little contemptuously even while regarding this healthy interest as a decided sign of grace in a girl there's ceylon postage on the top isn't there it isn't rare though twenty-four cents i gave two pence for it but i've had much more expensive ones only i swapped them if you want to see a rare one here's a virgin islands down here i think i'll see the rest another time colin thanks said dolly i'm tired now i mayn't have time to show you another day said colin so you better but dolly was gone her passion for information having flickered out as suddenly as it rose she knew that english-looking green stamp well enough there had been dreadful days once when it had seemed always floating before her eyes the thing which might send her to prison she was much older now of course and knew better but for all that it had not quite lost its power to plague her yet for this time at least she was sure that harold had not been teasing she had burnt the letter and it came from ceylon vincent must have written it and he had come back and meant to scold her she had cried so when she heard he was drowned and now she was afraid to see him a shadow she dared not speak of had once more fallen across her life 
Caffin came up with a Bradshaw in his hand. "'Had a hunt after it, I can tell you,' he said. "'And then your old landlady and I had a little chat. "'I couldn't get away from her. "'Aren't you fellows ready for some dinner?' "'And the relief with which Mark had seen the carriage roll away below "'had really given him something of an appetite. "'Before dinner, however, Mark took Caffin up into his bedroom "'under the pretense of washing his hands, "'but with the real object of preventing a hideous possibility "'which, for his fears quickened his foresight, had just occurred to him. "'If you don't mind,' he began awkwardly, I, "'I'd rather you didn't mention that I had written— "'I mean, that you didn't say anything about illusion, you know.' "'Caffin's face remained unchanged. "'Certainly, if you wish it,' he said. "'But why? Is this more of your modesty?' "'No,' said Mark, weakly. "'No, not exactly modesty. "'But the fact is, I find that Holroyd has been going in for the same sort of thing himself, "'and—and and not successfully, and so I shouldn't like to—' "'Quite so,' agreed Caffin. "'Now, really, that's very nice and considerate of you to think of that, Ashburn. "'I like to see that sort of thing in a fellow, you know. "'Shows he isn't spoilt by success.' "'Well, you can rely on me. I won't breathe a word to suggest your being in any way connected with pen and ink.' "'Thanks,' said Mark gratefully. "'I know you won't.' And they went down. Mark could not but feel degraded in his own eyes by all this hypocrisy. But it was so necessary, and was answering its purpose so well, that his mental suffering was less than might have been expected.' At dinner he felt himself able, now that his fears were removed, to encourage conversation, and drew from Holroyd particulars of his Ceylon life, which supplied them with topics for that evening, and prevented the meal from becoming absolutely dull, even though it was at no time remarkable for festivity. "'I tell you what I can't quite understand,' said Caffin on one occasion. "'Why did you let us all go on believing that you were drowned on the Mangalore, "'when a letter or two would have put it all right?' "'I did write one letter home,' said Holroyd, "'with a faint red tinging his brown cheeks. "'I might have written to Mark, I know, "'but I waited to hear from him first, "'and then one thing after another prevented me. "'It was only when I sent down to Colombo months afterwards "'for my heavy baggage that I heard what had happened to the ship.' "'Well,' observed Caffin, "'you might have written then.' "'I know that,' said Holroyd. "'The fact is, though, that I never thought it possible, "'after going off the ship, as I did at Bombay, "'that I could be reported amongst the missing. "'As soon as I discovered that that was so, I wrote. "'No doubt I ought to have written before. "'Still, when you have a large estate on your hands "'and you feel your health gradually going, "'and failure coming closer and closer, "'you don't feel a strong inclination for correspondence.' He fell back into a moody silence again. Perhaps, after all, his silence had arisen from other causes still. Perhaps, as his health declined, he had come to find a morbid satisfaction in the idea that he was alone, forgotten by those he cared for, until his very isolation had become dear to him. He had been a fool, he knew that now. His two friends had mourned him sincerely, and would have been overjoyed to hear that he was alive. He had wronged them. What if he had wronged Mabel, too? Another had won her, but had not his own false delicacy and perverted pride caused him to miss the happiness he hungered for? At all events, he thought, I won't whine about it. Before I go out again, I will know the worst. If the other man is a good fellow and will make her happy, I can bear it. But deep down in his heart a spark of hope glimmered still. "'Well, I must be going,' said Caffin, breaking in on his reverie. "'I've got to pack before I go to bed. "'Look here, Vincent,' and he consulted the Bradshaw as he spoke. "'There's a train at ten in the morning from Euston. "'Gets into Drigg late at night. "'We can sleep there and drive over to Wattswater next day. "'Will that do for you?' "'It's rather sudden,' said Holroyd, hesitating. "'Oh, come, old fellow, you're not going to back out of it now.' i stayed over a day on the chance of bringing you. You promised to come just now. There's nothing to keep you, and I've set my heart on having you. Then I'll come, said Holroyd. We'll meet on the platform tomorrow. Mark breathed more freely again. 
he accompanied Caffin down to the front door and then as they stood for a moment in the little passage dimly lighted by a feeble kerosene lamp on a bracket each looked at the other strangely well said Caffin with a light laugh i hope you are satisfied he'll be well out of the way for at least a fortnight and if this gilroy business comes off he may be taken off your hands altogether before you come back i know said mark you've been awfully kind about it the the only thing i can't understand is why you're taking all this trouble for this was beginning to exercise his mind at last oh said caffyn is that it well i don't mind telling you i like you my boy and if anything i can do will save you a little worry and give me a companion in my loneliness into the bargain mind i don't say that hasn't something to do with it why i'm delighted to do it but if you'd rather see some more of him before he goes out again there's no hurry gilroy will wait and i won't say any more about it 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 seems a good opening said mark hastily not without shame at himself perhaps the sooner it is arranged the better don't you think caffyn laughed again you old humbug he said why don't you tell the truth you found out he's a defeated rival and you don't care about having him sitting sighing on the doorstep of that little house in where is it on camden hill well don't be alarmed i think he'll go and i promise you i won't try to prevent him if he's keen on it he laughed aloud once or twice as he walked home mark's tender solicitude for his friend's future tickled his sense of humour and the funniest thing about it is he thought that i'm going to help the humbug mark was up early the next morning and hurried holroyd over his breakfast as much as he dared he had a ghastly fear of missing the train in consequence of which they arrived at euston at least half an hour before the time of starting caffyn was not on the platform and mark began to dread his being too late and then he thought with a shudder i shall have him on my hands for another whole day another day of this would drive me mad and i must see mabel this morning the luggage had been duly labelled and there was nothing to do but to wander up and down the platform mark feeling oppressed by a sinking premonition of disaster whenever he loosed his hold of holroyd's arm for a moment he was waiting while the latter bought a paper at the bookstall when suddenly he felt himself slapped heavily on the back by someone behind him and heard a voice at whose well-known accent he very nearly fell down with horror it was his terrible uncle hello you know this won't do young fellow what's all this he began too evidently bursting with the badinage which every benedict must endure why you ain't going for your honeymoon before the wedding that's suspicious looking that is no no it's all right said mark trembling how do you do uncle i'd i'd rather you didn't talk about it about that here not quite so loud well i don't know what there is in that to be ashamed of said his uncle and if i mayn't be allowed to talk about a wedding which but for me mind you would have been long enough in coming about perhaps you'll tell me who is and as to talking loud i'm not aware that i'm any louder than usual why are you looking like that for hang me if i don't think there's something in this i ought to see to he broke out with a sudden change of face as his shrewd little eyes fell on holroyd's rug which mark was carrying for the moment mark for all your cleverness you're a slippery feller i always felt that about you you're up to something now you're meaning to play a trick on one that trusts you and i won't have it do you hear me i tell you i won't have it what do you mean faltered mark for an instant he thought himself detected he did not pause to think how improbable this was you know what i mean i'm not going to stand by and see you ruin yourself you shan't set a foot in the train if i have to knock you down and set on you myself if and his voice shook here if you've got into any mess and it's money i'll clear you this time whatever it costs me but you shan't run away from that dear girl that you're promised to i'm deed if you do mark laughed naturally and easily enough did you think i was going to run away then from mabel you tell me what you're doing here at this time of day then 
said his uncle, only partially reassured. "'What's that you're carrying?' "'This? My friend's rug. I'm seeing a friend off, that's all. If you do not believe me, I'll show you the friend.' As he looked back at the bookstall, he saw something which stiffened him once more, with helpless horror. The man at the stall was trying to persuade Holroyd to buy a book for the journey. He was just dusting one now, a volume in a greenish cover, with bold crimson lettering, before recommending it, and the book was a copy of the latest edition of Illusion, the edition which bore Mark's name on the title page in his despair mark did the very last thing he would otherwise have done he rushed up to holroyd and caught his arm i say old fellow don't let them talk you into buying any of that rubbish look here i i want to introduce you to my uncle i wasn't asking the gentleman to buy no rubbish said the man at the bookstall resenting the imputation this is a book which is having a large sale just now we've sold as many as but here mark succeeded in getting vincent away and bringing him up to mr lightowler how are you sir began that gentleman with a touch of condescension in his manner so it's only you that's going off well that's a relief to my mind i can tell you for when i saw mark here with that rug i somehow got it into my mind that he was going to make a run for it and there'd be a pretty thing for all parties eh "'Your nephew very kindly came to see me off, that's all,' said Holroyd. "'Oh,' said Uncle Solomon, with a tolerant wave of his hand. "'I don't object to that, you know. I've no objection to that. "'Not that I don't think, between ourselves, mind you, "'that he mightn't perhaps be better employed just now.' "'And here, to Mark's horror, he winked with much humorous suggestiveness at both of them. "'That is very likely,' said Holroyd what i mean by saying he might be better employed continued uncle solomon is that when yes yes uncle mark hastened to interpose but on special occasions like these one can leave one's duties for a while now there i think you make a mistake you make too sure mark i tell you and i think your friend here will bear me out in this that in your situation it don't do to go leaving em in the lurch too often it don't do mark could stand no more of this a lurch now he said what an odd expression that is do you know i've often tried to picture to myself what kind of a thing a lurch may be i always fancy it must be a sort of deep hole have you any idea vincent Mark would have been too thankful to have been able to drop his uncle down a lurch of that description occasionally, particularly when he chose, as he did on this occasion, to take offence at his nephew's levity. "'Lurch is a good old English word, let me tell you, Mr. Schoolmaster that was,' he broke in. "'And if I'd done as many a man in my position would, and left you in the lurch a few months ago, where would you have been? That's what I'd like to know.' For I must tell you, Mr. Holroyd, that that feller came to me with a precious long face, and says he, Uncle, he says, I want you to— Mark felt that in another moment the whole story of his uncle's intervention at Kensington Park Gardens would burst upon Holroyd with the force of a revelation, and he was at the end of his resources. Where was Caffin all this time? How could he be so careless as to be late? Uh, i don't think it's quite fair to tell all that he expostulated weakly fair said uncle solomon i made no secrecy over it i did nothing to be ashamed of and hush up and it's no disgrace to you that i can see to be helped by an uncle that can afford it well as i was saying mark came to see me here a small juggernaut car in the shape of a high piled truck came rolling down on them with a shout of by your leave there by your leave from the unseen porter behind mark drew vincent sharply aside and then saw caffin coming quickly towards them through the crowd and forgot the torpedo his uncle was doing his best to launch he felt that with caffin came safety caffin who had evidently been hurrying gave a sharp glance at the clock sorry to be late he said as he shook hands binny fetched me a hansom with a wobbling old animal in it that ran down like a top when we got half way and of course the main road was up for the last mile 
However, I've just done it. Come along, Holroyd, I've got a carriage. And the three men went off together, leaving Mr. Lightowler behind in a decidedly huffy frame of mind. Goodbye, Mark, said Vincent affectionately before he got in. We've not had time to see much of one another, have we? I can't say how glad I am, though, even to have had that. I shall try not to leave England without seeing you once more. But if we don't meet again, then good-bye and God bless you, old boy. Write to me from abroad and tell me where you are. We mustn't lose touch of one another again, eh? Good-bye, said Caffin in a hurried voice before he followed. I've got your Swiss address, haven't I? And if... If anything happens, you shall hear from me. The next minute, Mark stood back, and as the long line of chocolate and white carriages rolled gently past, he caught his last sight of Vincent's face with the look on it that he could not hope to see again. He saw Caffin, too, who gave him a cool side jerk of the head at parting, with a smile which, when Mark recollected it later, seemed to account for some of the uneasiness he felt. But, after all, this desperate plan had prospered, thanks to Caffin's unconscious assistance. If Vincent had been gagged and bound and kept in a dungeon cell till the wedding was over, he could hardly be more harmless than he would be at Wastwater. Two more days, only two more, and the calamity he dreaded even more than exposure would be averted for ever. None but he would call Mabel Langton his wife. Thinking this, as he left the platform, he ran up against his uncle, whom he had completely forgotten. He was harmless now, as a safety match bereft of its box, and Mark need fear him no longer. "'Why, there you are, uncle, eh?' he said, with much innocent satisfaction. "'I couldn't think where you'd got to.' "'No, oh, I dare say,' growled Mr. Lightowler. "'And your friend nearly lost the train looking for me, didn't he?' I'm not to be got over by soft speaking, Mark, and I'm sharp enough to see where I'm not wanted. I must say, though, that that feller, if he's one of your friends, might have shown me a little more common respect, knowing who I was, instead of bolting away while I was talking to him, for all the world as if he wanted to get rid of me. Mark saw that his uncle was seriously annoyed, and hastened to soothe his ruffled dignity, a task which was by no means easy. "'It isn't as if I needed to talk to him, either,' he persisted. "'I've a friend of my own sort to see off. That's why I'm here at this time. "'Liverpool he's going to,' he added, "'with some obscure sense of superiority implied in this fact. "'And let me tell you, he's a man that's looked up to by everyone here. "'He's Budkin, and'll be mayor before he dies. "'And another thing let me say to you, Mark. "'In the course of my life I've picked up here and there "'some slight knowledge of human character.' and I read faces as easy as print. No, I don't like the look of that friend of yours. Do you mean Caffin? asked Mark. I don't know him. No, I mean that down-looking chap you introduced me to. All right, isn't it? Well, don't you have too much to do with him. There's something in his eye I don't fancy. He ain't to be trusted. And you mind what I say. Well, said Mark, I can promise you that I shall see no more of him than I can help in future, if that's any relief to your mind. You stick to that then, and— Hello, there is Budkin come at last. You come along with me, and I'll introduce you. He's not what you call a refined sort of fellow, you know, he explained forbearingly, but still we've always been friends in a way. You can't stop. Must go back to Miss Mabel, eh? Well, well, I won't keep you. "'Good-bye till the day after tomorrow, then. "'And don't you forget what you'd have been "'if you'd been thrown on the world without an uncle. "'There'd be no pretty Miss Mabel for you then, "'whatever you may think about it, young chap.' "'When Mark made his appearance at Kensington Park Gardens again, "'Dolly watched his face anxiously, "'longing to ask if Vincent had really gone at last. "'But somehow she was afraid.' And so, as the time went by, and no Vincent Holroyd came to the door to denounce her, she took comfort, and never knew how her fears were shared by her new brother-in-law. End of chapter 30